hello, I'm back again. Just wanted to keep you all on your feet. Uh, like they said, uh, my name is Kevin Ginty, and I'm a senior guitar performance major in the College of Music here at Florida State University. And as you just saw, my primary focus as a performance major is classical guitar. And when I say this to most people, I can, I can sort of group their reaction into either one of two ways. They either love classical guitar and they're all about it. They want to know what pieces I'm working on, how I file my nails, how I do everything I do. Or they have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about and they think I just play Freebird all day. <laughs> so this sort of dichotomy that exists between the two groups of people I introduced myself to leads me to believe that everybody loves classical guitar, they just don't know about it yet. And I think that this unawareness about classical guitar stems from a deeper misunderstanding about classical music in general, and that is the idea that classical music has become highbrow, elitist, and irrelevant. And to me, this is far from the truth. I believe classical music is relevant and there's a multitude of different reasons why. For one example, classical music has become so entrenched in our modern culture that you and I experience it on a day-to-day -day basis and we don't even question it. Maybe you were watching the Super Bowl this past Sunday and a commercial came on for Doritos and in the commercial there's two kids playing in the front yard and the mom comes home with groceries and she asks the kid for help for, with the groceries but they refuse so she says that they can't have Doritos so it turns into this awesome scene where one kid's riding a dog and he's got a lasso and he pulls the Doritos out of the car. And in the background, you may not have realized, but you were hearing two overtures from Rossini operas, the Barber of Seville and the William Tell Overture. Just in that simple Doritos commercial, you were touched by classical music. Another way classical music sneaks into our lives is through movies and the background music in these movies. Let's take my, one of my personal favorite movies, Up. And if we can think of the montage scene of Carl and Ellie and their lives together, and it goes through and they're saving up for this awesome trip, and for whatever reason they just can never make the trip until they're very old and Carl is gonna surprise Ellie with the tickets. And they're making their way up a mountain with the picnic basket for the surprise, and, she sadly passes on. And I think while the images on the screen are moving, I think the music in the background is what really touches our heart and this bittersweet waltz in the background really brings these images alive. So if you were to kind of mute the m music, I think you'd, you'd have a much different experience watching that movie. And a third way that classical music touches our lives um, maybe our kids' lives more than adults, is through cartoons. And, of course, a favorite example of mine is the Looney Tunes. And maybe we all watched this show and we couldn't wait to sing along with Elma Fudd to kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit. And little did we know, we were singing along to the March of the Valkyries, the Ride of the Valkyries by Richard Wagner, one of the most influential 19th century composers of opera. So these three ways classical music touches our lives on a daily basis, I think, is proof enough that classical music is relevant and that it's still very much alive. But another reason I think that classical music is still relevant is that it deals with the same themes that we see in many other forms of entertainment. The only difference is it does it through the medium of sound. So while a painter might express love and heartbreak through his brushstroke on a canvas, or an author might show comedy in words. Composers and musicians are taxed with the responsibility of manipulating intricacies of sound to create these themes. So it gets a bit more complicated, but the themes are still there, and they're possibly even more prevalent than in other forms of entertainment. So there's this issue with classical music, and people think that it's irrelevant and dead. And as a performer, it's easy to step back and say, well, it's the fault of a failing music education system in the United States, or the government doesn't provide enough funding for the arts. But I think as performers, we should take a step even further back and say, what is it that I'm doing that makes people think that my art is irrelevant? 
And I think if we take this step back, we'll realize that there are some questionable practices in classical music events that lead people to believe that we're all snobby and elitist performers, which is not true. We're just like you. <laughs> so let's take the performance I gave at the beginning of this TED Talk, for example. I came out and I bowed, I acknowledged you guys a little bit, but I didn't say anything. We didn't talk, we didn't interact like humans, which is what human beings thrive on. And there was no, none of that interaction took place. And so I sat down and I started playing and I didn't give you any context for what I was playing. And maybe for the first minute or so you were entranced by the beauty of my guitar or kind of intrigued that I was holding it the wrong way. Um, but I'm willing to bet that maybe halfway through you kind of started wondering about what might be on that calculus midterm this semester or if you remembered to switch the laundry into the dryer so that it didn't get moldy. And this sort of mind wandering that happens in classical music is, is natural if you don't have anything to connect with to the music. And so I would like to propose a challenge to artists to provide something to their audience to allow them to connect with the music. So let's do this performance over again. I'll come out and I'll bow. And, uh, so the piece that I performed was titled The Flight of the Lovers Through the Valley of Echoes, and it was by a Cuban composer named Leo Brower. So already I've given you three pieces of information that I didn't give you before that you can connect with. A Cuban composer, this poetic title, The Flight of the Lovers Through the Valley of Echoes, and the fact that his name was Leo Brower. These are all different ways that you can connect with the music already. And so the piece is also a programmatic piece, which means that Brower, as the composer, has a specific intention for the storyline behind the music, which is great, because I don't have to use my imagination to make something up. I can tell you literally what he was thinking. So in the score, he marks, um, there's the, the excerpt I paid, played was three different sections, and he marks different parts of the story in these different sections. And the story is based off an African folk tale about somewhat of a tumultuous relationship between these two lovers. And the first section is marked declamato, or declaration. And if we wanted to compare this to a modern relationship, we might think of it as maybe a pickup line. So it's just a single note melody. And it's kind of forceful and in your face, just like if you know you were trying to meet that girl at the bar that you wanted to talk to. And this section transitions into a, a part marked presagio, which translates to omen. And this is where we get some foreshadowing that maybe we're not going to get a fairy tale ending at the end of this song. And the way the Brower achieves this omen is through the treatment of the harmony. And he starts on this chord which is very beautiful, open sounding. There's nothing really questionable about it. But he moves from here to here. We start to get a little uglier, a little more crunchy. And finally we land here. And now we're, some, something's clearly wrong at this point. <laughs> this section moves on to one of the more poetic titles that I can think of, The First Gallop of the Lovers. And this is where Brower utilizes velocity, or the change of tempo, to signify the way you might feel when you're beginning a relationship and things move very slow at first, and then they grow and grow and grow until they reach a climax. And so the section starts pretty slow, but by the end we're really moving along. And so I played those three sections for you, and then there's a couple more sections to the piece which are all based off material from the original three sections. The next section after the first gallop is a, a second presagio, another omen. Following that we have recuerdos or memories and in this section you'll hear sort of, it, it almost sounds like two voices talking and it's very bittersweet and it sounds like it, uh, it sounds like it wants to go back to the beginning of the piece but it can't get there. So just like you might have a memory of the beginning of a relationship before things went south, and you want to go back to that, but you can't, 
this is what exactly what's happening in the music. And then following this section is the Valley of Echoes, and I think you'll hear the Valley of Echoes pretty clearly, at least I hope, otherwise I'm not doing my job. And then finally we close with the third omen, but this time we hear the chords in reverse, so we go from the ugliness back to the open, beautiful sound. So I would like to take this moment to invite you, the audience, to give classical music a chance. And as I play through the piece, maybe think of a relationship of your own, maybe one you're in now or one that was in the past, and see how the music brings back these memories for you. So without further ado, Leo Browers, The Flight of the Lovers Through the Valley of Echoes. <laughs> 